Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lip was twisted, the soldier was blanched, and the men were dancing, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about whatever happened to Inspector Gregson? Or Mrs. Hudson's husband? Or of Holmes's early clients? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 260, Reptiles and Amphibians. Hello and welcome once again to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at some of the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, why is your head oscillating from side to side in such a reptilian fashion? (laughs) It's uh, two reasons. One, I'm eager to see you. And second, I'm oddly attracted by that mouse on your shoulder. (laughs) Oh, good heavens, there's animals everywhere. Well, uh, this is uh, episode 260, and you can find the show notes at ihose.co slash trifles260. That'll take you to our website where you can look through the show notes, uh, head over to the links that we have here, and figure out a way to get in touch with us. There are a variety of ways. If you'd like to email us, we are simply trifles at ihearofsherlock.com. You can leave a comment directly on the show notes there. You can get to us on Facebook and Instagram, and YouTube, and Twitter, where we are at I Hear of Sherlock in all of those places. We would love to hear from you, and we would love it if you would share our content with other people who matter to you. So we are in the final episode of our series that we've done in Season 5. This is December. This is the 12th month in the year, and that means it is the 12th episode in our Exotic Animals series. Um, If you have been with us throughout this season, throughout the year, you'll have listened to episodes on things like Langer and Cheetah and Baboon and Mongoose and Vipers and Cormorants and Lab Rats and Jellyfish and Worms. My goodness, and beetles and butterflies and finally British birds. And here we are talking about reptiles and amphibians. And I should note that there are two other episodes that, um, uh, three other episodes. I mentioned worms and vipers from this season. We also talked about its snakish temper on episode 14 in the first season, talking about what a snake might have gone through under the employ of Dr. Grimsby Roylott. But once again, we find ourselves inspired by a volume from the Sherlock Holmes Natural History series written by Don Jewell in the mid-90s, I think it was. Yeah, this is from 1996. This is the eighth in a series of nine books. And this one is titled The Herpetological Holmes, a monograph on reptiles and amphibians in the time of of Sherlock Holmes. And so our goal here with this episode is to not only talk about these reptiles and amphibians that were mentioned in the stories, but also to give you some context around which these animals would have lived during that time. So, Bert, I am going to hand the reptilian reins over to you and have you walk us through reptilian culture in Victorian England. And luckily, I'm wearing my snake-proof gloves. What a terrific context it is, too. In Don Jewell's magnificent book, 
uh, you start out almost immediately with the story of the London Zoo. And, of course, that takes us directly to the Sherlockian reference where Holmes asked of Watson basically in the Milverton affair, have you ever been disturbed, Watson, you know, by the slithery nature of the snakes in the zoo? Well, the story of the London Zoo is really fascinating. It began in 1828, and it was all the work really of one man, Sir Stamford Raffles. And it began as a subscription service. So one day a week on Sundays, if you were a member of the Zoological Society, you had the zoo all to yourself. And the rest of the week, other people could actually get in. And by 1899, it had become amazingly popular. Well, in those days, of course, they didn't understand, certainly to the degree that we do today, the habits of some of these animals and what might happen when you put one creature in the same cage or near another. And so there are innumerable stories of keepers coming to work one morning, wandering down the lane of the zoo, only to find out that this unfortunate animal had made a dinner of the other one um, the evening before. And it's it's just absolutely fascinating. We can't figure out why our rodent exhibits keep getting smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the snakes keep getting larger. <laughs> That's remarkable when you think about it. So clearly, uh, the the zoos in the early Victorian times were not... Uh, places of scientific advancement. They were uh, they were merely a place to corral animals together, uh, not for study, but just for gawking at. Gawking and marveling. People apparently were just absolutely astonished by seeing, because bear in mind too, you know, in the 19th century, the only way you could see the majority of these animals. And snakes are a good example because there really were a very small number, I think only 12 species native to England. Um, the only way you could see some of these animals would be to get on a ship and go to the West Indies or go to Africa. And, of course, many of Her Majesty's military came back from service in the Middle East and elsewhere, of course, with stories about some of the creatures they'd seen. Hmm. So it really was primarily entertainment, but also a good deal of education. Yeah, well, clearly the uh, the zookeepers needed to be educated a bit, because I, I love this, this bit of information. Um, keepers started work in the reptile house at 6 in the morning, recorded the temperature as well as the maximum and minimum for the preceding 12 hours. Summer highs often climb to, wait for it, 52 degrees while winter lows drop to 39 degrees. These are each Fahrenheit, by the way. Uh, during the colder months, blankets were sometimes thrown into the cases, however, uh, but uh, visitors complained that they were unable to see the lizards and snakes hiding under them. <laughs> In spite of such inconveniences, the reptile house quickly became a favorite with visitors. It's wonderful, and of course we have so many references in the cases of Sherlock Holmes to snakes and reptiles. Mm. And in Don Jewell's book, we do, of course, get into the Milverton affair. And um, he does review much of what we've already talked about in other Trifles episodes. He says there is no venom of no snake that actually kills in seconds. And he refers to Doug Lawson's paper in the, a 1954 Baker Street Journal um, which got into that to some degree. And also he questions fang marks and so on. Hmm. And it seems that his general conclusion is Roylet probably died of shock. <laughs> shock or a, a heart attack brought on by uh, that snake coming back at, back at him, no doubt. Now, hmm. remind me, what is the reference to uh, to a snake or reptiles in Charles Augustus Milverton? Oh, well, that's the one early on where, um, you know, what, Holmes is comparing his revulsion at Milverton to the feeling one gets from seeing a snake in the zoo. You know, the, I think referring to the flat face of a cobra, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think, um, I don't think it was a cobra. I think it was uh, the, the creeping, shrinking sensation, the revulsion, uh, as he said, of uh, of the going to the reptile house. I think that was, it was called out by name there. Uh, oh. Let's see. He said, uh, do you feel a 
creeping, shrinking sensation, Watson, when you stand before the serpents in the zoo and see their slithery, gliding, venomous creatures with their deadly eyes and wicked, flattened faces. Well, that's yeah. how Milverton impresses me. There you are. That the wicked, flattened face yes. sort of reminded me of a cobra. Now, in Don Jewell's book, he, he talks about, mentions the 12 species of snake that are native to England and says three are mentioned in the canon. Hmm. And we've talked really about all of them in different episodes. One is the slow worm. Hmm. And then there's, of course, the adder or viper, or as we heard, <laughs> the wiper, adder <laughs> <Yeah>. or wiper. <laughs> and then the third is the cobra. Hmm. So that is very interesting. And and the cobra, you know where that reference uh, comes from? Yes, it's from the cases of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> Elementary, my dear Waldo, you've cracked it once again. You, you can't fool me. No, I I knew well, I. Well, that's Baron. That's Baron Gruner and the illustrious client. Because, that's right. He was said to be as it's... poisonous as a cobra. Yeah, but it's also, you know, the bonds, I think, the the embrace, the deadly embrace of the code. Mm, indeed. Well, let's take a quick break here, and we will come back with the other reptilian and amphibious references in the canon. Stay with us. The Baker Street Journal continues to be the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship, and it's been doing so almost consistently since 1946. There's an interesting history there after the first issue of 1949 where the journal went fallow for a few issues, but it was brought roaring back in 1951 and has been a continuous publication ever since. Now entering its 76th year, the journal publishes four quarterlies plus a Christmas annual. Those all come bundled in your subscription that will give you access to the scholarship, the thoughts, and the goings-on of Sherlockians and Sherlockian societies worldwide. The beauty of a Baker Street Journal subscription is it's a package deal. You get that wonderful Christmas annual, a fifth bonus issue every year and if you miss the opportunity to subscribe early in the year don't worry you can still subscribe to the full year at any point throughout the calendar year the publishers will catch you up with the previous issues that you may have missed and throw in that christmas journal as well so get on over to bakerstreetirregulars.com and make sure you get your subscription to the baker street journal the finest publication of sherlockian scholarship today All right, we are back talking about all things reptilian, amphibian, and, well, Bertillian. How about that, <laughs> How about that Bert? Uh, no, that, that's, that has to do with ears. Monsieur Bertillon. Um, so we were, we were talking about um, cobras, vipers, adders, etc. Um, what other reptilian visages do we have in the Sherlock Holmes stories? Well, I don't know if it's a visage, but I was really tickled to read Don Jules' mention of frogged jackets. Mm. Well, that was, so we're <laughs> moving into amphibian now. Yes. Frogged so jackets. So how does a jacket get frogged? That, that was uh, Don Jules' question. He said, you know, if Inspector Bradstreet in the Twisted Lip turned up one day in a jacket bedecked with frogs, could Thaddeus Sholto have avoided buying one? <laughs> But uh, after <laughs> after that joke, he points out that the frog to jacket refers to the uh, braided clip, you know, a vaguely military association that was quite popular on jackets at the time. Yes, and I thought that was uh, that was just a lovely reference. It it, it really is. Um, it, it's it's one of the more creative ones, I have to say. And if you've ever seen a frog closure or never seen a frog closure, they are they're decorative braids. They're they're they were popular in the 17th and 18th century. We see them on um, many um, uh, Asian-styled uh, clothes, uh, but you'll also see them on some of the fancier velvet smoking jackets in some cases as well. Uh, we'll have a link to frog closures and what those look like in the show notes. Um, we should also mention uh, the crocodile. Why there? Oh, right. There was a crocodile, um, almost as apocryphal as the crocodile that went after 
Captain Hook and Peter Pan and 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 swallowed his hand. In this case, the crocodile was after who? Jonathan's poor old Jonathan Small. Yes, getting smaller by the day. <laughs> <laughs> He actually was Jonathan Medium before he ran into the crocodile in the Ganges River. Uh, and yes. The croc snapped his leg off. Um, now, I don't know. I, Don doesn't go into this, but I don't know how uh, that works because I know alligators, which are American cousins of crocodiles, um, alligators typically don't um, – they don't snap things off. They typically drown their victims. They haul them underwater and place them um, in some kind of closure or nest or what have you and wait for the body to decay underwater before they will then start snacking on it. Well, Don Jewell actually does get into that. And um, basically, to sum it all up in just a sentence or two, he says that whole aspect of this, that his ne- his leg was you know, neatly um, snipped off or snapped off in that fashion is very suspect. Mm -hmm. And he does go into some description of the fact that such an animal would essentially drag its prey down underwater. And then (laughs) somewhat graphically, he talks about how the jaws would be used to, um, you know, take off um, bites of the individual to... uh, (laughs) To enjoy, to enjoy gradually, let's say. <laughs> Snack as you will, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, well, you know, another instance where um, an animal gets an unnecessarily horrific reputation, just like the great white shark did after Peter Benchley was done with him. Um, it's, it, it's terrible, really. You know, there there is another... Uh, another reptile in the canon that it's always troubled me, the Gila monster or Gila monster, um, because this turns up in, I think it was the Sussex vampire. Wa- Holmes gets a, uh, uh, or I think it was Watson got the initial letter from his friend, big Bob Ferguson at uh, Morrison and Morrison and Dodd. Uh, that's right. Morrison, Morrison and Dodd sent the, the note to Holmes and, Watson made the connection to Bob Ferguson. Um, the reference was vampires. And Holmes said, uh, you know, get down the, the copy of our V index, Watson. What's in V? And, uh, you know, there was Vigor, the Hammersmith Wonder, uh, and the venomous Gila Monster. Now, why the Gila Monster was classified under V simply because it had venom? Uh, <laughs> Well, the venomous jellyfish should have been under V as well, which would have saved a lot of time in the lion's mane, quite frankly. <laughs> well, that's true, and it, but it does indirectly prove that Holmes did not have Germanic dis- descent because then it would have been under, then it would have been under the W. Yes. Now, the the question I suppose is why. The Gila monster was in Holmes's index. Um, it is the Heloderma suspectum, suspectum, and um, the Mexican banded lizard, similarly, is the Heloderma uh, suspectum synctum. They're the only two venomous lizards known to exist in the world. They're similar in appearance, but generally prefer different habitats. The, the Gila monster referred to by Holmes in uh, the Sussex Vampire is primarily a desert dweller in southwest Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and Sonora. It's, uh, it's heavy. It has a heavy hooded body with a flat head and strong jaws. And the sausage-like tail is used to store fat and may vary depending on the individual lizard's condition. And when food is hard to find, a kilo monster's tail may lose as much as 20% of its bulk, giving it more of a uh, shriveled look. And adults range from 14 to 18 inches in length, although some uh, specimens have grown to as long as 20 inches. Um, The Gila monster relies more on taste and smell than on vision when coming up with uh, something to eat. It's uh, even been observed to track its prey by tasting the ground with its thick black tongue. Dinner consists mainly of bird and reptile eggs, as well as small mice and rabbits. <laughs> well, wow. clearly you've touched on it, you know, with that last reference 
to the fact that the Gila monster would chase its prey by tasting the ground. <laughs> Obviously, Holmes had at one point considered employing a Gila monster to replace Toby when he was ill and had disastrous <laughs> results. <laughs> but that, that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I've roused its snakish temper, causing it to turn upon the next person that it saw.